is carrying the wall, carrying my tomb. The only one to hear my song are the coyotes and the wolves. But if I drink enough of this flask, I can hear them sing your song too. Hi, this is Robert Latimer with the Bluff Creek Project. Uh, today with me today is a good friend and fellow squatcher, Daniel Perez. Uh, how you going, Daniel? I'm delighted to be here. Great. Uh, we've been looking forward to this because right now our location is at the 12 and H berm. Just a half mile from here takes us down to the flat area, the, pretty much the Peter Byrne location. Another half mile up takes us to the PG film site. So we were here today, uh, earlier today, the last few days. I think, Daniel, you got here pretty early, didn't you? I've been here for several days. Yeah. And you did some awesome trail work. When I was walking down, I was like, wasn't this overgrown? How come all these rocks are out of the way? So then I find out later that Daniel actually went down there and trimmed the trail, moved a bunch of rocks out of the way, and it looks great, and we do appreciate that. Very helpful. Yeah, I just think that because uh, it's not just us, but other people who are interested in the subject matter and the Patterson-Gimlin film, is that they would want uh, an unobstructed trail path to get down there, and uh, it would be more inviting for other enthusiasts and people who want to do uh, work down there to have an easy access to the film site. I think you're absolutely right, because at the Bluff Creek Project, one of the things we kind of feel, one of our obligations is to try to keep the film site accessible, and when people want to go see it, take them down there and answer some questions on it. And I mean, we started looking for the film site. You're one of our biggest resources. We were a consultant. Get down there. So let me talk real quick about who was here today. So, so far we had Rowdy. He just left about an hour or so ago. But uh, he was working on an experiment today with the camera with, with Daniel. We'll talk about that in just a little bit. And Bobo was down too. And then we had Dustin Sievers. Uh, he left a little early, but he was down helping us set up. We did a lot of work down at the film site. We can talk about that in just a little bit after you do some homework here. And I think, who did I leave out? And it's just me. And, uh, of course, we have another guest here, too, a, a guy working on a book, John Connor. John O'Connor. John O'Connor. And he'll be back shortly. He's, I think he's warming up in the car as I, as I speak. He's a little, running a little cold. Because last night's temperature, Scott, was in, what, 37? It was, it was cold, but if you brought enough blankets and sleeping bags you could uh, warm up pretty good I know I did oh and we were blessed today last yesterday last yesterday it rained all freaking day just about and it was cold and that was good for us we got down to the film site we were able to do a lot of project like setting up our our dock area we'll talk about and just to, to figure out the, the camera lens sizes so we got that all squared away and then rain started just as we were finishing yesterday rained all the rest of the day through part of the night and then today la la it's a beautiful day we had a great time and it was awesome so um i first met you i guess in 1999 that would be about right i think it was september of 1999 you had... and I, I went up to investigate a report you had uh, told me about so i said well i'm up in the area i may as well so i did yeah and it, that port we've been at be even bogus somebody was trying to pull a fast one over by where I live, I live towards the Hanson area, and this person, I was trying to get even, I guess, or just thought she was funny, try to report a, a sighting location near where I live. I live in a kind of a rural area, kind of near open creek area where the Eel River goes. It's a lot of wild country. Um, anyhow, and then after that, I give you a ride along, and we talked about different sightings at Humble Road Park, and there was the Caltrans sighting off the avenue. We I want to say that was about 1994. Yeah. And I believe the way I remember it, the individual's name was Mike Gardner. And he's probably retired from Caltrans. Yeah. He, was, he was, as he put it, a heavy equipment operator. I featured him in the newsletter, The Bigfoot Times. But that lead was developed by visiting the Legend of Bigfoot uh, shop right off the 101 uh, highway. Yeah. And even today... Even though he's a sole witness by himself, as far as I'm concerned, he's one of the most impressive witnesses I've ever encountered. 
because first he told me he lived in the area, the Garberville area, all his life, and that he hunted and fished the area, and he surely knew about Bigfoot as a youngster, but never saw any evidence whatsoever, so as far as he was concerned, it was all mythological folklore and legend until he actually saw one on the Avenue of the Giants uh, while he was patrolling the roads to keep them open. That was an early morning sighting, too, if I remember rightly. That was an early morning sighting before the sun rose and uh, possibly four, five o'clock. Yeah. And interesting because it just happened to be at the time there was another uh, car on the road ahead of him that was on the straightaway of the Avenue of the Giants. And then as this car went by, whatever was on the road realized that the car is gone, it's safe to cross. At least I'm trying to think like whatever crossed the road. Mm -hmm. But unbeknownst to whatever was crossing the road, here comes Mike Gardner around the turn. And as soon as he made the turn onto the straightaways, his uh, high beam lights uh, lit up the subject. And within one second, he was a confirmed believer in Bigfoot because he was looking at one. And it crossed the road very fast, and he wanted to get a second view of it, but was unable to by going up the road and turning right into the woods in the direction it was going, but was unable to see it again. But I was very impressed to meet him. In fact, I don't recall because I think I met him December of 1995. In fact, I'm pretty sure it was December 1995 because I came up here to investigate the Redwoods footage. And so I thought, well, let's let's hit uh, two birds with one stone. And I, as I recall, I got his address. I may have phoned him briefly, and, I, and it was the Christmas holidays. Mm -hmm. And I said, I'm so-and-so. I'm coming up to see you. And the way I remember it, he had a long driveway... And so I parked my motorhome at the bottom of the driveway, and I start walking up, and here's this man almost like guarding his house with his arms crossed, <laughs> just looking at me. And because Bigfooting at the time wasn't a big deal, or it was hardly registered on anyone's social consciousness, yeah. and he was just kind of wondering about me. I get up, I shake his hand. I said, Happy Holidays, and I said, uh, My name is Daniel Perez. Uh, I heard about your report. I would like to hear it from you firsthand, and I take this stuff very seriously. And I kind of warmed him up a little bit because I'd never met the man before. Right. And uh, before long, I was in his living room, and I was asking him questions, and he began to relive, relive the incident. And he got so excited, he said, You know what? Why don't we just jump in the car, go down to the yard, get the Caltrans vehicle, and go over the same road that I happened on? And I went for the ride along, and he showed me everything that happened. And like like I said, he was a non-believer, because like I said, he lived in that area all his life, never saw anything. And within that brief moment that this subject crosses the road from... I believe from left to right and then going up into the woods, it's coming from, he apparently got the impression it was coming from the Eel River, possibly going down there to look for food or something. So he was, he was driving northbound on the Avenue of the Giants. That's correct. He was yeah. driving northbound. And so, uh, again, within that just two-lane highway, this thing crosses. I mean, he's com completely convinced that, my God, there's one right in front of me. Of course they exist. Yeah. He went from a, a complete skeptic doubter to a 100% believer in the course of perhaps two seconds. That's, that's incredible. You always hear stories about like that where people, they have this thing. They're adamant. You know, they're, they don't buy into it. They're hunters. They're outdoorsmen. They're experienced. And all of a sudden they have this encounter. They can't justify their own minds. And what are your options? You know what a bear looks like. And all of a sudden you got this thing running on two legs and a couple strides across the road. And you go, that, that's no bear. So that, that's pretty incredible when you think about that. So yeah. that, 
That was pretty fun on that one because uh, uh, there's also been a few others at Humboldt, you know, screaming, yelling, chasing people back to the cars, rock tossing. Uh, I've had a couple encounters there, but mostly vocalizations, and I don't know quite what it is. It was like I was, I was on a search and rescue. We we're looking for these guys, four people who got lost, and once they got lost, they decided to call on their cell phones nine one one, and say, "Hey, we're lost. Can you come get us?" But good thing there's a GPS locator on the phones for a lot of those. So they end up way at the top of the ridge. So at what point do you realize you're lost? When you're when you are walking on a flat surface area along Matoll Road on the trails, and then you climb a mountain, and now you, you you finally realize you're lost. Anyhow, so we went out looking for them, and I didn't get to them before one of the other rangers found them. So I I drove the quad back down to my vehicle, and I loaded the quad onto my car. We're talking about nine thirty, ten o'clock, looking at almost ten thirty now. So I loaded my, my quad on the back of the car. I turned my engine on. I'm getting ready to go. And I'm like, oh, I better go check to make sure it's secured because there's nothing like driving on the Matoll Road and dropping your quad out of the back of your truck because your property didn't secure it because you're too tired to drive. So I went back and I, I checked it. It was all good. I was going to get back in my car. And I heard right above me with the, probably about 50 yards, I heard this. Right above me, just like that. And it's like, what? So I didn't know what that was. It, it sounded like it could have been a knock, but well, why there? And then another time, a few years later, I was hiking around that Rockefeller Loop Trail, and I had just passed one of the red, big redwood trees, and I was going to cross the footbridge, and I heard another knock or a clap or whatever above me in a grove of redwood trees too. So that's twice at Humboldt I've experienced something unusual, and they're all knockings or claps, one or the other. I have a kind of a theory for knocks or claps because sometimes the large trees they have a crack runs all the way up them and every once in a while they just shift now did is that what i heard that's popping sound of the big redwood trees shifting or was there something up there knocking on something or clapping but yeah there's always get a few reports coming in at burlington campground in the winter time we get people who are camping in the campground because we close most of it there's a few sites open says, yeah, we heard some really weird screaming on the other side of the river. <laughs> oh, really? What did it sound like? And I don't know. You know, we just run down the list. Was it a coyote? Was it an owl? But you get some weird screams coming across there. And th that part's closed to the, because the footbridges are out. And you got to work to get there and try, go away the other side. But anyhow, so I can see at Humble Redwood, uh, 53,000 acres, adjacent to a bunch of private timberlands which increases the wildness there you know threefold and there's a potential for weird stuff going on up there but anyhow en enough on that i think now that uh matt moneymaker since 1995 who started the co-founder of the bfro website yeah is that we've get we get a better picture of the reports from what county is most of that in well it's humble county humble. pretty much yeah we get where at one time there was no place to deposit these reports, people who get on the internet can deposit them. And so we get a better feel for what is happening in certain areas mm -hmm. and that once the Humboldt County area with the big redwoods was very quiet in terms of Bigfoot wise, but right. now it seems to be alive and well. And the Bluff Creek area in which we are in right now seems to have quieted down. But I might, might emphasize that with uh, David Polites in 2008 releasing the Hoopa Bigfoot project mm -hmm. about the Hoopa Indians, who, excuse me, Hoopa Native Americans, that he documented a tremendous amount of reports from that area, which would be immediate on immediate on the east and west side of the Highway 96 as you're coming up to this area. Yeah, along the so, Trinity Rivers towards a, climate. A whole, a whole different area. So one gets the impression that whatever might have been in the Bluff Creek area at one time in the late 50s, 60s, and 70s, and 80s has kind of dispersed. Yeah. For what reason, I don't know, but generally animals move out when the food supplies change or the mating supply changes. Right. So there always is a shift in reports. In some areas, they're pretty consistent. But, yeah, I've had some strange things here in the Bluff Creek drainage. But, again, you, there are experiences. I can't prove it or otherwise. Right. Yeah. So. And, and one thing I want to emphasize throughout and throughout that I told uh, John O'Connor here is that 
And this is a very important point, a very simple sentence, but very important, is that I can't overemphasize the fact that we are investigating Bigfoot reports, not Bigfoot. And there's a big difference there. Mm -hmm. It's not like we have a Jane Goodall out there yeah. actually studying firsthand a chimpanzee in front of her. No one has ever been able to make an appointment with a Bigfoot. Not yet. <laughs> and so, again, we're studying the reports, not the Bigfoot itself. So that is a very important distinction. We're doing follow-up investigations. Yeah, and really, that's all you can do. Because there's not a person on this planet that could make an appointment with the Sasquatch. Those who claim they can, that you see on the YouTube videos and social mm. media, I would just have to say uh, that is fabrications <laughs> or wishful thinking. Right. Well, I, I can't argue with that. Because lately now, when you start going on the YouTube channel or you know, even on some stuff on Facebook, they're putting some stuff up. They're putting photos up, like at the Coalition. Uh, any of you guys listening to the Coalition, it's, 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 there's some good stuff coming in the Coalition up there. And But you get on there and you got these people putting these photographs up with red circles around uh, blob squatches, basically. And then they're saying, what's this? So I don't know how many of those guys are serious or just looking for some fun at the expense of other researchers. But people have an experience, so they hear something and they don't quite know what it is. So all of a sudden, it's, it's an encounter. Or they take a photograph... We like to see a series of photographs that call movies, you know, to get more accurate description of what's going on. Or even foot impressions. They'll take one foot impression, they'll photograph it, and they'll say, oh, it's a squatch print. And you're looking at it going, I can't even tell it's a print. It's like, well, show me the series of prints. And, and you know, it, how, did you measure it? How, how large, how wide is the stride? You know, how wide, you know, what's the, what's the step? What's the stride length? How wide is it? So all these questions that we'd love to ask these guys, but they put this stuff up. And they wonder why people don't take the Bigfoot for them very seriously. You know, they got all these yahoos showing up and putting all this stuff up there. And it does affect the credibility. Like, how many people do you tell that you're a Bigfoot researcher? And what do they say when you tell them that? I actually don't advertise. Mm. I'm, as I explained to several podcasters uh, when interviewed, uh, I said I try to fly just below the radar screen. Mm -hmm. Where to the serious Bigfoot community, they know who I am, but most people do not know who I am. Like, for instance, John O'Connor may have not known who I was before this time. Did you? I heard your name. You heard my yeah. name, but really yeah. very little about me. Mm. So that's exactly the way I like it. So, but go on. The mysterious man in the shadows. A little bit. Yeah. Because, you know, you don't want to have to be at a job site because I'm a union licensed electrician mm -hmm. and explain every day... Yeah, I'm into Bigfoot, and then there's 10,000 questions. Right. You know, do you really think they exist, or that can't be real? And it's just like, you know, you get that all the time. So I just, just assume just uh, don't advertise too much when you're in your work, work environment state. or in your private environment. Uh, you know, occasionally I wear the hat when I yeah. publish the month, monthly newsletter when I go to the printer, but that's basically it. So you go to work, you got these new newspaper clippings all taped to your locker. <laughs> you got these practical jokes sitting all over the office in, at your expense. You know, and, and so, yeah, when I, when I did an interpretive program for the public at the park, and the ranger I work with, who eventually became my supervisor, it was, he, he teased me a lot about it. And uh, I just laughed along with him and says, yeah, you're right. But to argue on subject matters like that, I mean, if you, it takes two to argue. Yeah, and I don't like to engage very often either. Yeah. Well, it's just uh, we're dealing, as far as I'm concerned, we're dealing with an extremely rare primate that, number one, if it's rare, and number two, if the population isn't that big, and number three, if you have mostly a nocturnal type of animal, it's not often that you're going to see them that people will see them, but occasionally mm -hmm. they are seen and they're reported. And so that's what we're trying to figure out what's out there. That's cool. I, I'm going to change gears here. I got to ask sure. you this question. How did you get started in pursuing the phenomena of Bigfoot? About 1973 at the walk-in movie theater uh, with my older brother and older sister. And we went to go see 
The Legend of Boggy Creek. Mm. And as far as I was concerned at the time when we went to go, I just thought it was just another monster movie that make you scream and jump up in your seat and kind of Godzilla-like. Yuck. And so when I actually was watching the movie, I couldn't believe that the narrator on the movie, a docudrama, yeah. was kind of asking the viewers to kind of take this seriously. And they never mentioned Bigfoot. So I and at the time I had no idea what a Bigfoot was, and uh, being about ten years old at the time, ten eleven, it's just like it was all taking place in Arkansas in the Falk area, which is as far as as I mentioned earlier, as far as I'm concerned, Arkansas could have been the moon. Yeah. So I had no concept of how far and whether this was all legit or anything, and so I think. It wasn't too much longer, maybe a year or so, when uh, I kind of became a little more familiar with it. Uh, and I guess I heard Bigfoot and Yeti or Abominable Snowman. And I went to the library and uh, got some books on the subject and uh, away I went. And so that's that was the my start. And so I've, I've been at it steady ever since. And Early on, my dad was an electrical engineer mm -hmm. well, throughout his career. Yeah. But early on, he would bring... They used to have the Los Angeles Times newspaper. And I don't know, back in that era, there used to be the AM edition and the PM edition. Wow. So AM meaning in the morning. Yeah. And then because that was the internet back then, the newspaper, and they were big and fat. And so the PM edition was often changed from the, from the AM. So I would... He'd bring the newspapers and read them and then have them on the kitchen table. And as I got interested, I go, well, maybe there might be some stuff on Bigfoot in the newspapers. And sure enough, there was. And so I, I was trimming some original newspaper clippings. And we bought our shoes at the J.C. Penney. And so I got a J.C. Penney shoe box and started putting those newspaper clippings in the J.C. Penney shoe box to collect them. Little did I know... In 2021, at age 58, that I would still be doing this, <laughs> and that at this point in my life, I have the largest physical files in the world on the subject matter, which I'm quite proud of. Yeah, we talked earlier, you said you had like a couple rooms designated as your library research center. Yes, there's one room that's largely the files, and then one room that's largely all the books, and some of them extremely rare, and then that's where I produce the newsletter, mm -hmm. the office, as I call it. Do you ever, in the future, do you ever plan to like uh, open it up to people to go to, to your library to do research? Uh, no. Yeah. But, I mean, if someone were to call me and uh, and I possibly knew that individual, I said, well, yeah, sure. Uh, you could come over and take a look at the files. Like, for instance, if Lyle Blackburn were in the neighborhood mm -hmm. and he said, hey, I'd like to stop by and look at the Texas uh, reports state by state, the Texas uh, Texas newspaper clippings, and then, yeah. sure, come on over. Because uh, the files are divided up in such where state by state, like there's Texas, Washington State. Right. And then it, as you pull a file, which is about three three inches deep, and it's in a in like a box, a paper box where they keep 500 sheets of paper. That's how they used to have paper, I guess. Right in a box. I've seen those. Yeah. That type of box, you'd pull it out, and everything is in chronology chronological order. So you could start from 1800 and work your way all the all the way up to 2021. So it's all chronological, but by area, hmm. by state. Like Washington State, you could start off. At 1900, you get to 1924, then you run into Ape Canyon, yeah. and then you go forward, you get to 1969, you get into Bosford. So that's, the organization of the files is very well kept. I consider myself the caretaker of these files, which will probably eventually go to Stanford University upon my death. Yeah. Because that sounds like a pretty, pretty an organized, because you're an organized guy. I like to keep yeah. everything organized. I like to have organized thinking and uh, an organized way of looking at mm -hmm. the mystery. I think that's good because you could follow along pretty good. I know we, we, when we're doing the Bluff Creek Project, we had to go to you for a lot of information to try to find the history of that. 
And you were very and helpful. I remember, well, actually, at first I was not very helpful because I kind of discouraged it. I just kind of uh, said this was after Rene de Hinden's death, who was one of the chief investigators of the film site. I just kind of said, well, I don't think even if you found it, whether it's going to be worth any... I mean, I was kind of of the opinion, what more could we learn from it? You right. know, we've got the film and yeah. everything else is just uh, immaterial in a way. But uh, between you and Steven Struford, you guys kind of pestered me in the such. <laughs> I said, well... Yeah. Maybe maybe they're maybe maybe they're doing some good work and so kind of step back and let them do what they want to do and yeah. I regret having that pessimistic outlook outlook initially and uh, so lo and behold you guys uh, rediscovered the film site which uh, and when I found out about it I thought it was just huge and so uh, naturally. Uh, the two of you, Stephen Struford and you, Robert Leiterman, became the Big Footer of the Years. First time ever that we had the Big Footer of the Year, two people. Yeah, double nomination. And, That's uh, cool. As far as I know, the cover of that newsletter has been displayed in two books now. Sweet. Yours and another one that was called Seeking Bigfoot by Michael Newton. That's mm. his name, who just passed away in September. But yeah, so that, I think the work on the rediscovery of the film site is just enormous. And now not just our small group of associates can go see it, but others. And with the internet and social media, there's a ton of people who want to come down and see it for themselves at their own convenience. And is, how can I say it, the mecca of all of Bigfooting. Oh yeah, ground zero, or that's what yes. we call it. Because... Um, um, well, our goal was to make it more available and guide people in, answer questions, and which has been great. Like our whole trip today in the fall, every year since, well, I guess for me, uh, 2010 was when I got pretty serious about actually the film site. And I've been here every year since that. And so has Rowdy. We talked about that the other day. Uh, one thing I would like to say about the Patterson-Gimlin film site, which is abbreviated as just the PG film site mm -hmm. today, is that... The first time I went down there and there was positive confirmation that this was the film site, what blew me away back in 2012, and even today that still blows me away, is how deceptively large that film site is. It's, it's a very big, you could fit a football field in it. It's that big. But when you're seeing it, uh, say, on the internet or on a television special, you're seeing it through a flat frame right. and you just don't get the impression that this area is that big until you're physically there and you're saying my god this place is big it's a big area and so film just has a way of compressing everything where you think everything is just one dimension but actually there's a photographer there's a subject and there's a background right and this all takes up space so that's the thing that I would tell anyone is that when you get there, you'll realize how deceptively large that film site is. The other thing I'd like to point out is that the only thing that I know of that skeptic, doubter, or believer in that film agrees upon is the big tree. That yeah. we all agree that there's one tree <laughs> that's massively big, a yeah. Douglas fir, and everyone agrees that really is the big tree. I've ne there's a hundred percent agreement on that, but everything else there's no agreement on. Right. Because I remember when you're looking for the big tree, is I'm like, well, there's some big trees. I needed more. I, I I call them the artifacts, which are the logs and the stumps and the root balls and the approximate location to where they should be based on Rene de Hinden's seventy one overview. And I remember. I'd, I think the first time I've probably been to the film site was probably uh, 2007, and, and Bobo took me, and Cliff took me. We walked along the base of some hillside past some big trees, and I, didn't, I couldn't tell you where we went. But I do remember that the film site was overgrown, and I could not see for the forest for the trees. It was so overgrown. And I'm pretty sure there were root balls out there, or logs, but I couldn't see them. And it wasn't until, I guess, 2010, towards the end, that we started seeing these kind of things. But that's always been a challenge. Now, what was the convincing one? Was it 
the two pictures of our map and the dependent overview with the circles with with alphabets on it was that the the pushing factor for you when i was there in the summer of 2012 with you and a, a group of other people yeah and i saw the trees such as sp specifically the big uh, the fat tree and the skinny tree, which we now call Laurel and Hardy, in relationship to the big tree and the stumps that were still there after uh, all these years, 40 plus years, everything was in exactly the right place. And so it was easy to make the deduction that this is the film site. So I was sold instantly and immediately. And... Uh, it's unfortunate that other people prior to this had made claims that they knew where the site was. Mm -hmm. And looking back now, that it was plainly obvious that that was some pretty shoddy research on their behalf. And that perhaps it had nothing to do with Bigfoot research, but more to do with accentuating their own personal agenda in terms of being a popular person or an important person. But actually, how important could they be if they get the wrong answer? Right, but if you admit you made a mistake, I, I, I respect them when they admit they made mistakes, but to blow over it and not even acknowledge it and continue to stick to how you your theories, when you, I mean, I don't know, I don't want to pick out anybody with initials as M and a K, but I don't know if he's ever been to the true PG film site. No, the person you're making reference to is M.K. Davis from Mississippi, and Early on, he did some pretty decent work, but now I think his 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 mission is just to get uh, notoriety for himself and uh, possibly to make as much money as possibly you can off of Bigfooting. I don't know how much you're going to make, but it's just like uh, it doesn't really have anything to do with the subject matter. No, that's unfortunate. I've seen other things on the internet where this. Somebody from the southeast, not him, takes the uh, Google map, and it's of the Gulch area, and he takes the Dehendon 71, he superimposes it over the top of it, says, here it is, and, and then he has on their escape routes, you know, for Patty escape routes. So we get a lot of people, well, I shouldn't say we get a lot of people, there's people who do research who don't actually go into the field to do their research, and they, they I guess, uh, internet researchers. And I then, think, yeah, I guess you would call them keyboard warriors. Mm -hmm. And it gets frustrating on my part where they push their stories, even though they're incorrect. And we've invited some people to come down and check it out, but it falls in deaf ears. Uh, it's like you invested so much time into this project, and now you have to say, well, I might have made a mistake. But I, I respect the people who say I might have made a mistake, and they fix it, versus Ignoring that and just continue on and say I'm not gonna I'm not gonna acknowledge it, and that's frustrating. And uh, I I told you this before, but you're a person that always gives people proper credit, and we do appreciate that. Well, the thing is, it's just like uh, to be an objective writer, journalist, is that when you do give people proper credit, in the future you develop a reputation of someone who is fair and unbiased. And whether I believe in Bigfoot or not is, mm -hmm. is immaterial because I do write a newsletter is that it is my job as a journalist or a writer to be fair and unbiased with the literature that I'm working with or whatever I'm working with. So that's the way I see it. Well, I, I appreciate that too. Let's talk about the Bigfoot Times. How long has the Bigfoot Times been, been running, and when did you first start it? The Bigfoot Times in this inception has started uh, January of 1998 and has gone through the present time. It's a monthly newsletter. It's a physical newsletter that's mailed out to a membership. I would say we're at about 870, 875 readers now. That's pretty good. Uh, it's, a, it's a good number for a small newsletter that mm -hmm. caters to just a small audience uh, Bigfoot, in specifically. Uh, and so I enjoy doing it. It keeps me focused, keeps me on track. And uh, uh, we're going on to, 
two years from now, I guess, we'll be on our 25th anniversary. And wow. I'm happy to say that it's the only printed newsletter that is mailed out to a membership in the world on this subject matter. There's there's no other publication quite like it. And uh, the, we don't regurgitate old information. Well, let me rephrase that. Hmm. We don't just put out information that everyone knows on the Internet. For instance, in the October edition, this edition, we had a, a very serious discussion about the late Bob Titmus and his association with the PG film. And on a newspaper article that has long since been forgotten from 1972, Bob Titmus explains to the reporter that instead of driving down from British Columbia to see the tracks in California at the PG film site, he flew. Because you're wondering how how in the world does he get here so quickly? Yeah, so he gets there that quickly because there's an admission to the newspaper reporter that he flew down. So you get the sense of the urgency of the matter to get down here to investigate, and that's exactly what he did. And so that makes more sense. I mean, had there had there not been that newspaper article, there could have been people who could have been very skeptical, say like, how could he have possibly driven from British Columbia to Northern California in that amount of time? Right. But now we have an explanation to a question that was never questioned before. And going back to the newsletter, you actually travel around to get your stories too. I do sometimes. I do. And you've yeah. been to some conferences too, if I remember it. I've been to I've been to quite a few conferences, uh, not just as a speaker, but as a member of the audience as well. So happy both ways. Uh, I spoke in Ohio in May of this year. In 2017, I was at a Washington State conference where I heard I was a member of the audience, and I was privileged to hear the late Dr. John Bindernagel give his last talk, and Bob Gimlin talking as well. So, uh, yeah, I'm I'm okay being in the audience, and I'm okay in front of the podium. I remember that one I, I saw it I saw it actually on YouTube, where you're you're talking to uh, um, Rene DeHinden, and you're you're speculating about playing devil's advocate. And I don't think he got it. No, he did not. Yeah. He took it the wrong way, and I guess uh, he got emotionally involved or emotionally upset over the fact that uh, you could present the devil's advocate. Mm-hmm point of view on the PG film, but you have to remember at the time when that talk was given in May of 1995, that was the height of the O.J. Simpson trial. And at the time, uh, you know, there was the people trying to prosecute him and the people trying to defend him. So each side had their point of view. And I thought, wow, as I watched that trial on television, like everyone else, because there was little else to watch on TV, it was on yeah. every channel at the time, that I said, well, wouldn't it be interesting and neat to do kind of a devil's advocate presentation on the PG film? So, which I did. And uh, it was just to show people that I was open-minded enough to do a devil's advocate. Uh, lucky for me, they actually did, uh, they videotaped it, and now it's, it lives on the internet, yeah. on YouTube, and various uh, websites and whatnot. Well, one of the ways to best present a, prod- a product is to play devil's advocate. So you're answering your own questions. So I thought that was well done. I mean, I thought, kudos yeah, to I, you. I, I'm just happy that they, they, they had the presence of mind to videotape it and to upload it to uh, the internet now. Very happy. Good. It's good to hear that. So, what would you say the best evidence of proving Bigfoot exists beyond reasonable doubt? What do you think is the best evidence for you? That already exists? That already exists. Oh, by a landslide margin, the PG film. And the reason I say that is generally you just have a witness seeing something crossing the road while they're driving a vehicle. So, that's a very short observation. In this instance, you have not just one eyewitness, but two eyewitnesses who observed something on a sandbar here in Bluff Creek. So there, that takes it to the next level. You have two credible witnesses. And then if you were to stop there, you have three horses that reacted to whatever they were viewing. And generally, how can I say it? I doubt if it was just a man in a costume 
who didn't have any smell that whether these horses would have reacted the way they did because you can fool a person but it's very hard to fool an animal mm -hmm. so there the horses react and so that's that's your second aspect of the PG film. The third aspect is they had the presence of mind, Roger Patterson did, to take a movie motion pictures of the subject, which last about a minute. And so as this is going on, the other witness, Bob Gimlin, is observing everything. So there you have some, one person filming and mm -hmm. one person witnessing the filming. So there's another aspect of it. And so after the subject goes out of view, the camera runs out of film. They have the presence of mind to make plaster castings of the tracks that were left behind. To my knowledge, Roger Patterson made either two or four castings. Uh, so, and you can you go to the next aspect of that evidence is that. Uh, the film site was immediately known within days and Roger Patterson hoped to get some tracking dogs down from Canada to go after to get this Sasquatch Bigfoot, which never happened. But if this were all a fake, the last thing you'd want to do is have tracking dogs on the scene. And Roger Patterson did in fact call the newspaper that night, so it was the next the very next day it was in the newspapers and so if you're faking something you really don't want to have people know about it too much especially the film site because people could go there and investigate and possibly find out something and so that's another aspect of it is that there was immediately immediate publicity right after the film was shot and then by Monday October 23rd a timber management assistant by the name of Lyle Laverty showed up on the site. Somehow he found out about it, possibly more than likely from the newspaper, mm -hmm. and that uh, he was working in this area and was stationed at Laos Camp and went to go look at the tracks himself. And he knew it was in this area and he drove his vehicle and they, they saw it from the road from his vehicle and he stopped to take some photos, and he was, I think, 175 pounds at the time. And he said, he did admit to me in a video, in an audio taped interview that he says, my boot tracks were not sinking anywhere near what the tracks that he photographed, that the tracks were in the ground very much deeper than his boot tracks. So there's another aspect, someone who's not even into Bigfoot, who sees the tracks immediately and Never once did he say that he felt there was any deception there. And towards the end of the month, a Bigfoot investigator by the name of uh, Bob Titmus flies down to the film site to investigate and make about a dozen right-left footprints. Uh, and that there, that is the documentation of the evidence left behind the footprints. And so that's another aspect of it. So in terms of evidence or in terms of best case ever there's never been a case that even remotely comes close to this and you have a film and oftentimes well there's 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 a groups of people that argue that film sometimes is far superior than a digital videotape so that's that's it and that's my opinion about why this case is the runaway best ever. Why it's never happened again, I don't know. Perhaps Roger and Bob got extremely lucky. It's like winning a considerable amount of money in the lotto. They just happened to pick the right numbers. They just happened to be at the right place at the right time. Because there was those three sets of footprints that they, that they were called. They were notified about these. So they came up, brought them back up there to go see those. So that window, that timing window, like you said, it was just like the number came up, should have bought a lotto ticket. Yeah, so so yeah, that, that that's another aspect of it is that if you were to just talk about the Patterson-Gimlin by itself, then you've taken the whole PG film out of context because it's not an isolated event. 
and it's an event that has uh, a preface to it, is that in this area from the Blue Creek Mountain and Onion Mountain, just miles away on the same ridge essentially in the Bluff Creek area, is where in uh, late August, early September, tracks were reported in that area and the late John Green and Rene de Hinden and Don Abbott came to investigate. And so that was the preface before the PG film, which happened in late October. So it's just like you could build a case, you could kind of connect the dots. Here you have footprints, and Roger was hoping to come in with his movie camera to document more footprints for a documentary he had planned to make. Mm -hmm. But instead of seeing the footprints, he actually met the film the the footprint maker and he got to film footprints too and he got to film footprints too now this wasn't the first time roger was up there was it no he had been in this area uh, possibly twice before in 63 and 60 63 and 64 in october investigating because the the track that uh someone showed him or directed him to in Laird Meadow, I think, was October of 63. And in his book, I think he has that that was found October of 64. But researcher David Murphy actually saw the original casting at Pat Patterson's house. And on the back side of the casting, it said that it was October 1963. So I'm assuming that a mistake was made and that more than likely with the original casting that he inscribed on the back of it, the date. Mm -hmm. And when he wrote the book later, that he got the date wrong. But maybe he was also here in October of 64 as well. I don't know. But he's been up here before. I remember hearing about that. Yes, he was absolutely here in this area before. So he was familiar with the area. And he was no newbie Bigfoot researcher. No, he was he was a, he was a, a veteran investigator, and uh, he went up to visit with John Green uh, before the film was shot. I want to say it may have been 1965, 1966, but he told John Green that he wanted to come up and get material so he could write a book on the subject. And uh, so when he left, I remember John Green telling me that he says. Uh, I asked John, I said, well, did you think he would get a film? And he says something like, hell, I didn't even think he would write a book. <laughs> so not only did he write a book, but he got a film. So he just far exceeded John Green's expectations. That's pretty incredible. Because like all, most people think, oh, he was just, he got the wild hair up a second opening. He decided to go up and, and film and he got lucky and saw Bigfoot. But he he was doing interviews and researching. Um, yeah. Do you remember I, when he first started doing all that research? Well, according to Dave, well, accor by Roger Patterson's own admission in his book, he said he wrote 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 he said he read an article by Ivan Sanderson, and I think it was in True magazine that Ivan had, Sanderson had an article about Bigfoot here in Northern California, and it really got Roger Patterson interested. Uh so I think that was probably the late 1950s. So he kind of got started shortly after the Jerry Crew tracks were being found up in the Bluff Creek area. And so in terms of big fighting, he got, he got uh, you could say, it was almost like Jeff Bezos getting started with Amazon in 94, I think it was 94, when the internet was very young and seeing the potential of it. So Roger got involved very early on by Ivan Sanderson's article and really ran with it. So he was one of the the, the first generation Bigfooters. That's pretty incredible. When I, when, I, when I heard about that, I was like, you're kidding. Yeah, it's not just like it's coincidence sometimes. Yeah, I'm going to change gears here a little bit. And... Um, in, in, tw in 2012, when we came up to the film site and we brought Bill Munns up, one of the projects we worked on, uh, that you worked on, we were there to assist you, is you had one of the original cameras and you were trying to film 
uh, Bobo walking across the sandbar. What was the, what was the intent of that project you're working on? I wanted to see uh, Bobo at a known height, how he would look with a 25 millimeter lens, because at the time I had the turret Kodak K100 equipped with a 15 and the 25 millimeter lens. The other lens was uh, a different lens that mm -hmm. had nothing to do with anything. But uh, unfortunately, that film, when it was exposed, was, I believe it came back underexposed or it was washed out. So it was of no value. But I did, I, the way I remember it, I did get some still images of Bobo. And one of the reasons, I think Bobo was 6'4 at the time in 2012 in his boots. And one of my motivations was to see if uh, with a piece of 2 by 4 behind him of a known measurement that if we could use that piece of wood and I think I was 50 feet away from him mm -hmm. and in another instance I was 100 feet away from him and I, we were on the PG film site to see if it was feasible to use a piece of wood, a two by four, cut at 24 inches, exactly two feet, as a scale to measure Bobo when you develop the film. And sure enough, it does work. And so in the summer of 1971, Rene de Hinden collected a piece of wood that was seen in the film site, uh, well, that is seen in the PG film, that the subject either steps on or right next to. And so he took that home because he, he saw the, the value. He took it home as a souvenir, but he saw the scientific value of it in terms of a piece of evidence to possibly measure the subject in the film. And so Chris Murphy did some fooling around with that piece of wood in terms of trying to get a height of the subject. And with that piece of wood, which was measured at about 26 inches, he was able to determine that the subject in the film was about 7 foot 3 inches tall, which is about the way I feel about it, too, mm -hmm. that it's about 7'3". Uh, early on in the mid-90s, early 90s, let me think, late 90s, Peter Byrne, when he had uh, resources to do his Bigfoot research project, employed uh, Jeff Glickman and NASI to, I think it was NASI was North American Science Institute, to, uh, to do a study on the film. And by super, superimposing a man in the same position that the subject was in in the film, they were able to determine that the subject in the film was about seven foot three inches tall, plus or minus one inch. So, in two separate ways of going about trying to determine the height of the subject, that they came up with an answer that was almost remarkably dead on with one another, using the piece of wood and superimposing a man into the same frame as the subject to try to determine the height. So that's how that was done. And I think that's actually a pretty good uh, gauge to measure, pretty good way, two different ways to measure the height of the subject. Yeah, we, we also did a recent thing too. This trip we came up here to do some more experimentation to try to determine the size of the lens. You wanna talk about what, the, what we did out there at, at Bluff, at the film site? Uh, what we did today, myself, uh, Robert Leiterman and uh, Rowdy Kelly and, it also, uh, and John O'Connor, who was a reporter, actually a writer. Dustin Stevers, too. And Dustin Stevers. Yeah. We wanted to determine to see which lens was the best fit for the frames that you actually see that Roger took in terms of FOV, field of view, from left to right so when you go when you look at the frame itself the field of view the angle of the view from the viewing lens the filming lens shows you so much to the left and so much to the right 
that's called your field of view, then it cuts out its edge of frame. And so we wanted to see which is the best fit that would match Roger's camera uh, at the time in question, whether it was the 25 or the 20 or the, or the 15. And so until that film is processed, we had the same type of camera, the Kodak K100, and the same type of film, uh, 16 millimeter Kodak film. And so we've got to wait about a month to have that film processed to see what the results are on it. But it'll be interesting to see what is the best fit, whether it's a 20, 15, or 25. Uh, initially, Rene de Hinden, one of the chief investigators of the film, told me personally by phone that the camera that Roger Patterson rented was equipped with a 25 millimeter lens. But that data has since uh, been questioned. And so when you question things, you're not questioning things because you're vindictive towards another personality, but you're questioning things because you're data-driven, at least right. from a scientific point of view, is that if you're data-driven, then no one can argue against you because the data would suggest that Possibly it is not the 25 millimeter lens, or by retesting, possibly it is the 25 millimeter lens. We don't know. But when you start talking about cameras, lenses, distances, it becomes somewhat complex in that you have to keep things organized. For instance, just in another subject, when Rene was there in 71 and 72, I think that was about the time when he started pulling measurements about measurements from where Roger was standing doing his filming to some of the stumps and some of the, some of the trees that were seen in the film. And just today, uh, Robert Leiterman was able to catch a mistake. And it doesn't seem like it was intentional, but it, it appears that one of the stumps that was measured was incorrectly me measured in the numbers were transposed, and I think those numbers were 137 and 170. Yeah. Uh, 170 actually belonged to the other stump, and 137 belonged to the other stump. So it may have been a, a what you would call somewhat of a clerical error, error, but not with intent. Right. Because. And so we have to understand that whether you are just a, a big footer or the scientific community or the man on the street that. People do make mistakes, and other people will catch those mistakes. And it's uh, you could just say uh, it's spilt milk. There's always a, a rag to clean it up. So it's not a big deal. It's not a conspiracy or anything like that. Yeah, that's well said. Because because when I was like, we we measured those distances between the stumps and everything, and the far left side, we didn't measure that one that's in the that's in the frame fifty through three fifty two frame on the left side. We didn't measure that particular stump because we already know wh which stumps we needed. So, according to Hendon's photo, he has a 352 photo, and he drew on it all these angles of measurements he did, and then he used numeral numbers to not to, to label these stumps. And the one he labeled numeral no, numeral numerical number two, uh, and they said the distance was 136.5 feet. Well, that's the distance to the leaning stump. It's not the distance to that one stump because that one stump is 170 feet. So what we did today is we remeasured it. We figured out that's where the the clerical clerical error was. Just the numbers transcribed over. Like when we were trying to take the measurements for the film site, because actually you helped us do a lot of those measurements between stumps and the background trees, which, as far as I'm concerned, wasn't done before. But the background trees trees connecting them to the stump artifacts. And we want to make sure we got it right, you know, double checking, cross referencing, because we don't want to be that guy who makes a mistake and then somebody calls you on it and say, oh, you know, you're, you're fudging your data because you didn't do it right. But we're not saying that Dehinda did. It's just a transcription on one spot. Yeah, it was an error made without intent. Yeah. To, to, to be deceptive or anything. It was just a, uh, you can't blame anyone. It was just a clerical error. Uh, but one nice thing about, everything about the Patterson-Gimlin film site, even in two days it'll be 54 years since the film was shot, is that 
after five decades of time that you could actually still do uh, real work down on the film site in terms of measurements. And uh, it, no one has ever done the type of measurements that Robert Leiterman and his colleagues have done. And I think it's these numbers are going to be useful uh, because I just think it's a very important subject. The idea that we have relic hominoids, hominids, whichever way you want to describe them, still existing on the planet today, not just man. It's just a, a very big, gigantic question in itself where the, 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 the consensus of the scientific community is that none of these uh, relic species, whether it's the abominable snowmen or the Almosti in Russia or uh, the North American Bigfoot or the Yowie in Australia, there is no hard physical evidence that any of these things exist. But if we were to find evidence that one of them exists, then that would likely spur on a massive uh, engagement by the scientific community to find out more about the others. That is so well said. I'm going to take you right back to the film site and our project we worked on the last couple of days. You guys ended up building a platform to extend the upper sandbar because a portion of it has been washed away. So you guys used local, local materials, built the platform so you could stand on for frame number 352 from Roger's position. And at the very back end, we had the artifacts. We had, well, we had the, the maple. We had a light hanging from it so we could see it from that distance. You had just past to the right of the uh, Lord Hardy trees, some other big trees in the background that can be seen at the far right of 352. Then you have the smiley stump that we put a light on. And then you had the far left, the stump. So we had like four lights at one time so you can move back to the starting position for 352 and see it all in the same frame. And then based on that, you guys pretty much lined it all up. And then you had um, um, Mr. O'Connor in a, in a light colored outfit walking the course for you filmed it for a 10 second period right around 352 area. Then you did a few uh, poses. How, how many of those walk bys did you guys do? I guess we talked about that earlier. We did uh, three walks. And the three walks were one at 10 seconds with the 25 millimeter lens, uh, one with the 20 millimeter lens again for 10 seconds, and one with the 15 millimeter lens at, for 10 seconds. And then we had them in a stationary position for 10 seconds with the 25 millimeter lens. The same with the 20 millimeter lens, he was stationary for 10 seconds. And then with the 15 millimeter lens, he was stationary very relative to frame 352 for 10 seconds. So again, we're trying to get a feel for what a man of a known height is compared to the subject that was filmed by Roger Patterson. I thought that was an awesome experiment because watching you guys go through it, you know, uh, like, like test one, this is the size lens, watching you guys put the lens on, having Rowdy shoot it, you were recoaching it, the, the, the pathway, Great teamwork, and it was. I'm glad I was, I was proud to be part of that project because I can see, I can see a lot happening right there. Because you never, you envision, how in the world are you going to determine based on location, the type of lens that was used? Because once we know the distance, once we know the lens, now we have the height, you know, and that's the big formula. And so far, um, uh, Roddy seems to think it's a little bit different. He's he's more like a six. Was he saying six five or something, and and you're more in the height of seven something? Seven three. Yeah. I think six six, uh, even six feet. Any, I think that's just too small. Mm -hmm. I know that when John Green was here with Jim McLaren in June of '68, that he went home and wrote his first book. I think that came out in '68 on the track of the Sasquatch, and there was a chapter I believe called Roger Patterson's movie. And based on Jim McLaren, who in boots was, I think, about six feet, five inches tall, mm -hmm. that he estimated that the subject in the movie film was six, nine, right around that area. And uh, 
So six nine again is getting close to seven feet, and uh, my own opinion, based on the foot size of the subject that was leaving tracks, that with a fourteen and a half inch foot, uh, that you're probably going to be in the neighborhood of over seven feet tall, and so you just look at some of the frames that uh, the McLaren movie that mm -hmm. was made of by John Green in June of 68 and then you look at the Patty film and I think someone made a composition of both films where you could see both subjects there kind of superimposed on one another as you could just see how much bigger Patty is compared to Jim McLaren who's 6'5 and was under 200 pounds at the time. Patty is considerably much bigger in girth and so if someone is going to argue that that is just a man in a costume then it's heavily padded so then the next question you'd have to ask how can you have muscle expansion and contraction when you have all the padding it you just can't have both no, so it's, yeah yeah bill munz did that study the bounce test study and uh, that, that kind of proved the point on that so i think it's a great experiment now what size lens, based on what we've done the last couple of days, if you were to guess at this point, not to put you on the spot, but what size lens do you think it might have been? It seems like we're leaning in the direction of the 15, between 15 and 20. And I think Bill Munns said something at a certain time that, that there was also a 17 millimeter lens. I'm not sure if Kodak made that or if it was just... Uh, a 17 millimeter lens on the market that was interchangeable with the Kodak K100 camera and I think they called it a C mount hmm. and so maybe it was a 17 millimeter lens but the way my thinking is is that uh, when that camera was marketed in the box in the mid 60s and a person could go out and buy it, the fixed lens camera, not the turret model, is that it was sold with the 25 millimeter lens. And so if it was the 25 millimeter lens, uh, I'm, at a, I'm at a loss to explain the height of the subject. Uh, but we, we don't know because at the time, Roger rented the camera from Shepherd's Camera Shop in Yakima, Washington. And I think that was in May of 67. But didn't pay the rental on it. And But somehow they got the camera back. But And I think Rene somehow found out that it was a 25mm lens. But the 25mm lens doesn't seem to fit correctly with what the experimentation that we're doing. Basically, I'm saying that the 25 millimeter lens doesn't fit the experiment. And so, if it doesn't fit the experiment, then it's wrong. Mm -hmm. And so, you have to make the experiment work with the correct data. And so, it seems like it's anywhere between the 15 and the 20. And so, again, it's got to fit the data. And so it's an open question. But my my guess is, again, that if you deal with the subject that's about 7.3, which was arrived at in two separate ways by the superimposition of Mike Hodgson that was done with Peter Burns' uh, photography at the film site that was done by NASI, Jeff Glickman, and he came to the conclusion in his study that it was 7.3, and the other way of deriving the height of the subject by Chris Murphy using the piece of wood that Rene DeHinden lent him, that he was able to determine that the subject was 7.3, that I would say you're on the right track, and that you could kind of reverse engineer it and kind of say like, okay, if the subject is 7.3, then the lens would have to be such and such, would probably be anywhere between the 15 and the 20. So if it's the 20, then that's the answer. But at the present time, we're not certain. 
it's unfortunate that all of the paperwork, the rental agreement and all that that Roger had, that none of that is on a table for someone to inspect. It's all gone and it's all, you know, you're not ever going to get that stuff back. That's unfortunate. Now, operating the camera, you said it was like a pistol grip for the camera. That's why he was able to keep it, you know, going and steady uh, towards the end part. The, the movie camera that Roger rented, according to Peter Byrne, when he inquired about it uh, through the police department, because it was, uh, it became a police matter or a legal matter when the rental for the camera was not paid. I guess Patterson was accused of grand larceny for not paying the rental. And so that's how it became a legal matter. And Peter Byrne was able to inquire and he found out that that camera was, uh, at the time of the rental, was equipped with a pistol grip. So... If Roger Patterson had the pistol grip on it, that may have been, uh, if that were true, if if he you could take the pistol grip off, but he if he had it on it and was operating, taking this a motion picture with the pistol grip, that might explain why he did in fact get film footage as opposed to nothing. Right, because he had to pull that thing out of his saddlebag, roll off the horse. Get his foot stuck from the stuck to the bit stirrup, run down the old graded road section, tracking to see where Patty went, locating Patty, crossing the creek again, and trying to film her as she's exiting stage right. That's quite a chore. And I, I think the reason he was successful because did he not practice that whole move, retrieving the, the camera out of the saddle? According to Renee de Hinden, that he had practiced that if such an event were to ever happen, that uh, he would be ready and that he had the the camera in a saddlebag on his uh, horse on the saddle and he practiced that so yes when when the stuff hit the fan he was instinctive he did exactly muscle memory what he practiced I think that probably contributed to his success yeah instead of uh, just being scared stiff he reacted and he reacted reacted in such a way where he was able to get some footage and that is very commendable oh yeah well it's pretty exciting i mean the whole film site thing i i used to think there's no way in the world i'm going to ground zero much as zealots go there next you know in 2010 I, i'm starting to go there and i've been going there ever since but it's fascinating the film site is fascinating and it, after all you know you think about the biggest phenomenon in north america and we have a film that was taken by an individual that was researching it. And what were the odds of him stumbling upon it and filming it? I mean, you think about that. Is that one lucky guy or did he have well, some insight into what he was doing? There, there may have been a couple of things that may have aided him. And John Green pointed out is that the idea of riding horses, say for instance, you take the argument that Maybe the subject heard the, the, the hoofs of the horses walking. Mm -hmm. So, and maybe, for instance, if you argue that this particular Bigfoot had heard hoof horses, the, the horses walking before, and it was nothing to be alarmed at. So maybe that's why they were able to get the footage they were able to get. But more than likely... Because the stream is going downstream mm -hmm. towards the riders, Bob and Roger, who were riding upstream, that this, the creek is going downstream towards Roger and Bob. And also the wind direction was more than likely following the creek. So the wind was headed away from the subject that was filmed, not towards it. And so if it were very keen with its nose, it wasn't picking up any scent. So Roger... And also there was a a root ball system that was kind of blocking the, the, the view until you come around the corner. And so that may have had a, been another factor why they were able to be successful 
in catching, getting the upper hand on the subject that they filmed. They approached from downstream and they had the water, to, the white noise of the water to, to cover their approach. So we got a lot of factors going towards that. Yeah. Yeah. Is there anything else you want to add, you know, uh, about the film site or anything else of that nature? Well, I mean, the PG film, you may as well as walk in to, uh, how can I say it? It's almost like getting a film of Jesus Christ and wanting people to believe it. And it's just like very few people will believe it because a Bigfoot, for one, is, is not a proven species yet. But the fact that you see it on film in 1967... It just it just kind of blows your mind in that sense, and that uh, uh, people there's more people interested in the subject now, possibly because of social media and the internet, than ever before. So perhaps there might be a definitive answer in the future, in the near future. We don't know. Uh, let's hope so. Uh, but in the meantime, it's a, it's an interesting subject to be interested in. Doing interest, doing interesting times. Yes. Well, thank you so much for this interview, Daniel. Because we're sitting outside under this uh, tarp, tarp, and the, and it's cold. It's probably in the in the low forties here. Last night it was like thirty seven when I stopped recording it, and uh, there was snow up the top. And there's just three of us left in camp here. Um, yeah, and uh, it's been great. And I appreciate your time for here, and thank oh, no, you so much. No problem. It's just it's. It's rare that we get together, but uh, yeah. it's nice to have something, uh, a recorded discussion about what was uh, achieved today. Mm -hmm. And because it didn't rain today, it was I, I thought it was just a, a remarkably successful day. And so after today, we'll go back to the drawing board and say like, okay, this is what we need to do in the future. But that's a good thing because we're committed to the work and other people that we share this information with are equally interested to know about the results that we're coming up with. Because uh, we have to wait a month. I think Rowdy said a month before the film gets developed and that's going to really, really be good to compare with the, uh, with the, with the, with the bluff creek footage. So I'm excited about that. I'll be waiting for that. Well, thank you so much. I appreciate it. And thanks for coming on the bluff creek project podcast. And, uh, We'll have to do this again because I know there's a lot of other things like your your wealth of knowledge, At your walking encyclopedia. Oh yeah, and pick your brain, and you you can talk for hours on different subjects because you are one of the most versed people in the Bigfoot phenomena history, and you make sure of that because you have your own personal library to keep stay up on all that stuff. And it's always a pleasure interviewing you, and I like to do it again. So well, thank you for your time. Well, thank you. Appreciate it. Yeah. These canyon walls carry my tomb. The only one to hear my song are the coyotes and the wolves. But if I drink enough of this flask, I can hear them sing.